people assume that you need to buy properties more expensive than what you need to. And there's just the, I suppose the, what bleeds reads right in the media as well. So they probably put a lot of fear and assumptions into the average purchase price. But like I've got clients every day that are earning 60, 70, $80,000 a year. I've got a landscaping client on 70 grand. I've got a single mum who works at uh, Coles earning $81,000 a year. She's got two kids. And your team's sourcing her property right now as we speak, which is great. Hello and welcome. You're listening to Dash Insider, the auditory epicenter for passionate property investors seeking a life of freedom, choice, and abundance. And I'm delighted today to be joined by a guest, Olivia Ward. Olivia has been on this podcast before. If you're an avid podcast listener of this show, you would have seen her in 2020, back during COVID, when she um, joined the podcast to talk about her story about buying five properties in five years. And then again in 2022, where we talked about how she's been coaching investors to freedom, choice, and abundance. And we are back again in 2024 with property coach, Olivia Ward. Olivia, how are you? It's great to see you. Well, great to see you, Goose. Let's get <laughs> juicy on some of all of these myths, hey? Yeah, let's get juicy on a few myths. But before that, I want, let's do a little bit of a preamble, right? Because some people might have listened to previous episodes. And look, you are pretty prolific on, on social media and stuff. So a lot of people probably do know who you are. But just in case people don't know who you are, you're a property coach. Like, like what does that mean? Like, what are, you, what are you actually doing to people, uh, doing to people, with people, for people? How does it work? What's it all about? Help people, un- give people some context. Like, who are you? What do you do? And why do you do it? Yeah, thanks, Goose. Um, so, as a property coach, first of all, start off with my own investing journey, um, where I was like, okay, I magically got to apparently this 1% rule, which is like, yeah, I got to buy properties or more in my 20s. And then being from the corporate industry, um, I was walking around with people five times my income. And they were like, what do you mean you got five properties? I'm stuck on two or three. So I was like, hang on, I have a niche here for something to teach people. So that's kind of where my journey started from. Did it for myself and I was like, this is cool. This is exciting. I love talking about wealth building. There's so many unknowns and assumptions and myths that people make. So I want to help people do the same thing that I've achieved. So actually- How many many people have you helped roughly so far? Because you've been doing this now for- what, three-ish years or something? Four years, maybe? You know what? I actually only left my nine-to-five job 18 months ago. I Interesting. When I was working at Optus, yeah. Um, but yeah, about t- two years, I think, all up. So yep. just over like a, under 150, somewhere between 120, 150 clients. Which is a pretty chunky amount of people, and, and which is why I think it's really interesting. And so if, if you're just tuning into this episode, what we're going to be ta- tackling is nine myths, nine property investing myths that people get stuck on and in fact, we're going to debunk those myths as we go. And it's really interesting because these are myths that you have discovered after speaking. I mean, you've helped whatever it is, 150, 200 people, something like that. But I know that you've spoken to way more people than that because I know there's only a certain amount of people that have gotten into your coaching program, but you are very prolific online, very um, gracious with your time and very you get out there and you help people and you're teaching people a lot of stuff a lot of the time. And so um, I know that the impact has been a lot more than that and your insights have been gathered from more than 150, 200 people as well. And what's really interesting about your story is, you know, it's not just theoretical. Like a lot of people say things like, uh, you, you know, those who, those who can do, those who can't teach. But the thing is, you actually went and did it. You actually went and built a property portfolio. You know, you got into the top 1% of property investors nationwide with five properties. You did that whilst being a call center worker. And there are a lot of people out here, and nothing wrong with being a call center worker, by the way, but that's just to point out that you didn't have some high-flying executive position earning millions of dollars or anything like that. And in fact, you did it in your 20s. So what that proves is a couple of really interesting things. That proves that you can do it with a, you know, an average salary and you can do it whilst you're young. You don't have to kind of, it's not just for the, uh, an exclusive enclave of the wealthy. And that's why I think your perspectives are really, really useful. So I'm super excited to jump into these nine myths. Now, before we get started, we are probably going to have to break this episode into two parts. Olivia and I were talking before this and we we're like, there is a lot of ground we want to cover with these nine myths. And so as we go, we may actually um, split this episode into two parts. So this may very well become part one, but Liv, you ready to get into it? Let's do it. Let's do it. Okay. So myth number one, you've written here that you need, the myth is that you need your own cash to invest. Now, a lot of people do believe they cost you, what do you mean? Of course I need my own cash to invest. How else am I going to invest in property, Olivia? Of course I need my own cash. What do you mean by that? 
Okay, so there's a term called equity, which could be used for both investors and brand new people who haven't bought a house ever before. So let's just say you're at 25 years of age and you might have a parent who has equity within a home. They could give you that equity within a, within a house um, that they potentially have without them being too much risk to them. So that could be literally your cash deposit for the next property. All right, let's hang on. Let's let's break that apart a little bit, right? So basically, what you're so basically what you're saying is the bank of mum and dad, right? Now I'm gonna I'm gonna be the antagonist with all these kind of things just to make sure we tease all these tease it. So you're basically saying bank of mum and dad. So if you're a lot of people are gonna be sitting here saying, well, that's pretty privileged, isn't it? Yes. All right, so all right, so all right. So if you're lucky enough to have parents who've got a who managed to get into the property market and they've got equity, um, we'll, we'll circle back on that. Because I think it's a worth worthwhile uh, having to discuss. But basically, if you if your parents do have a property. They've got equity in their property. You're talking about taking their equity to buy your house. What do you mean by that? How, how, how does that play out? Okay, cool. So let's just say, for example, mum and dad own a house and it's worth $800,000 and they have a $500,000 mortgage still left on it. So which means they have an equity position of potentially $300,000. But the bank, we're not asking for all of that. We're just asking for a small percentage. And the way that the, a broker can set that up is like they withdraw that as the cash funds for the deposits and all of the costs that you need to get your foot in the door for the first one. Yep. So basically, they would extend their mortgage. Let's call it hundred grand. Let's say you need hundred thousand dollars to get your first property. They would extend their mortgage by hundred thousand dollars. They would get cash out, right? So they'd take cash out of that equity and then they give that gift you the cash. Basically. Yes. Correct. Yep. So that's one way. Um, I literally have a client at the moment, Sammy, who's doing exactly this. Uh, he's 20 years of age and his dad's just like, yep, give you the equity. And then what happens is when the value, and let's just say Sammy in this scenario, then buys the pro- uh, his first investment property, goes up in value by 100 grand, he can then release that $100,000 back to his parents a few years later when it goes up. Yeah. And so a little personal story as well from from my side, that's actually how Gabby and I got started. Because when Gabby and I got started, we had we had no money. Like we were broke. Like we had we had no money. And in fact, it took us two goes. So the first the first uh, property we tried to buy, well, the first property we bought, which was the the dud, it was the wrong property, wrong place, wrong time. It was an off the plane apartment in Melbourne, right as the market going down. We borrowed, uh, we borrowed some money off uh, some of our family members for that. Then that was a dud. Then we then we worked out how to invest properly, and then we went to go buy our first like you know proper investment property that worked well. And again, we had, we went to family for that. And the way we structured it wasn't just can you give us a gift and then we'll give it back to you. We said okay. Let's do this in a re- in real commercial terms. Let's set, set this up as a loan. So we said to our family members, we're not asking for a handout, right? What, what we're asking for is a hand up. And so uh, can we structure some kind of like private finance kind of deal where on paper, yes, they're gifting us the money because that's obviously from a financing structure perspective, you want to receive it as a gift because then it's the source of funds. But we've paid, we've paid all of that back to, back to them with interest, right? And so therefore it's commercial. So you don't have to go to your parents and just be like, Oh, please, cap in hand. Can I? Can I please have some money? Thanks. You can say no, no, no. I'm an adult. I'll send on my own two feet. But uh, I'm short on capital now. I'm going to give you more airtime on this in a second. But that that actually points to another way as well, right? So this whole idea that you need your own cash to invest isn't necessarily true. Now you may be in a position where your parents aren't. They don't have that. Maybe they don't have property, right? Maybe they're not in that position. Really, what we're talking about is not do you have parents who, have, who are on the property ladder. What we're talking about is you have a capital deficiency in your strategy, right? So you have a strategy that works, you have a capital deficiency. So then you got to ask yourself, well, what are all the ways you could get that capital? Now, if you're prepared to approach this from a commercial perspective rather than just like a hand out, you could then ask yourself, who else might have money that I could actually tap into as uh, to provide equity for my own investment? Now, just to be clear. That's how the biggest players do it. That's also how Blackstone does it, right? That's also how Blackstone does it. They'll raise a fund, right? Let's say it's a let's say it's a billion dollar real estate fund. They they are not putting in a billion dollars. This they might put in. All right, we've got a couple of hundred million, right? Because they're interested. But then they go raise money from investors, and then they go get debt on that, and then they go buy. Right? And so effectively, you're saying the same thing. And this is where JVs and all kinds of different stuff can come from, where you could actually, if you happen to know someone who was in a position. Now, you know someone can be pretty loose, right? You could have someone through a network. You can actually go out to networks and say, hey, I'm looking for an equity investor in my deal. 
And a deal doesn't have to be some kind of like big development deal. It could just be, a, you know, as long as there's a commercial structure for them to be able to get their capital back with the return, it can work just fine. So there's plenty of ways you can think about this to get started because getting started is the hardest part. And once you can get over that hurdle, you re- and if you could realize that you don't actually have to save it all yourself, you just need to be empowered enough to structure something that's commercially viable to the other party to make that work, that can also help you forward. What do you think about that? Absolutely. Amen. And I think it's just to what you were saying, it's just being um, opened to thinking about different ways of raising money. Rick do it, as you said. Uh, business owners do it all the time. And you'll be surprised how many people that are out there that would be willing to give a capital up front because they're time for to go and sort time poor to go and source for the deal. Yep. And a lot of people in Australia, it's like kind of easier to do than say, for example, like a business idea, right? Because there's there's proof and, and numbers behind it and people feel safe with property. So you'd be quite surprised. It'd be interesting if you wrote down like a list of people in your um in your contact list. Go to those people. Go to the ones that you think would reject you the, the quickest or the easiest. Um, and then just test the waters and ask them and then see how they reject you and then utilize that information, those objection handles to then go back and now use that to other people within your contact list to say, hey, what do you reckon of this idea? And it's, it's super interesting if you think about it, right? Because every investor wants to understand their risk. Now, if it's your parents, they're going to understand the risk pretty well because they understand you, right? So they're going to be like, okay, all right, what's the risk if I give if I give Olivia, you know, enough of a deposit for her property? What's the risk? They'll understand you well enough to be able to manage that risk. But if you think about it from somebody else, right, you need to then be able to manage. Okay, well, hey, here's the thesis. I'm going to go and invest in real estate, and that that's going to go up in value. And here's how I'm going to pay you your money back. Now, back to your point that you made earlier about um, one of your clients who's getting it off their off their dad. Just what was his name again? Sammy. Sammy, right? So Sammy's yep. getting it off his dad. And the premise is when the property goes up in value, he'll refinance the equity out and then give the money back. That is a viable way to repay the debt, right? So people say, so if you take capital, if you get somebody else to help provide the capital and the property goes up in value, that you can then refinance the equity out, assuming that you've got enough borrowing capacity to then give them the capital back. Well, you can structure it as a standard loan agreement where the investor gets their capital returned over a certain period of time with a certain interest rate. And the, another way that you can think about managing that risk, by the way, but it's useful if you've got some savings, right? But let's say you've got 30 grand in savings, but you need $100,000 uh, to get started, right? So you're $70,000 short. You know, you may be able to go to friends, family, et cetera, and go, hey, you know, let's do this together. Um, I'll be the, I'll own the loan. So I'll own, I'll own the debt. So I'll take on the debt risk. And by the way, here are all the ways that I'm going to manage the risk. So that we can make sure we get the upside, which may very well include working with a company like Dashdot that's got a great track record of being, you know, do, hey, I'm not going to do it myself because the first thing they'll say is like, you don't know what you're doing. Like, yeah, and they're correct. I don't know what I'm doing, right? So then it's like, you know, you as the individual may not be saying, I'll do it, go do this myself. You may as individuals may say, hey, look, here's a really good opportunity. Here's why I believe in it. And I'm willing to personally guarantee the capital, i.e., prepared to invest in this uh, thesis. And it's a really solid way to get started because, you know, as I mentioned earlier, getting started is the hardest part. And if you can just get over that hurdle, everything else gets so much easier. I mean, what was it like for you, Liv, when you, after you bought your first property, like how long did it take you to get to the first property? And then how long did it take to get to the second? And then how long did it get to the take to the third? Like just in very rough terms because it accelerates pretty quickly. Roughly, I was buying a property every 12 months because I bought, I think I got to like six, I got to six properties in six years. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, which is pretty good. And the first one probably took you several years to get, get into. Yeah, because I had to save. Oh, I, I saved and I hustled hard to yeah. save that first deposit, which was the hardest thing. So I sacrificed a few things to get there. Yeah. Um, the other way to think about this. Either or. Totally. And a lot of people might be thinking, yeah, but I don't want to go cap in hand to somebody else and asking them for money. And that is fine. But the big thing you've got to recognize is that the property market broadly is moving a lot faster than uh, wage, wage increases. So your ability to save your way into the market is becoming, you know, harder. It's getting harder and harder and harder to do. Once upon a time you could do it, but it is getting harder and harder and harder to do. And the price points have moved too. Like, you know, once upon a time, like back when we started Dashdot, we were buying. I think the cheapest property we ever bought was like one hundred and seventy-five thousand dollars, right? Which is, which by the way, performed very well. They like doubled their money on that, which is awesome. But, um, you know, bro- broadly, like in the first sort of twelve to eighteen months, we were buying a lot of properties that were in the sort of We'll call it 200 to 325 kind of price point. 
you just can't do that anymore. You know, like we're, we're like anything below sort of 450, 500 is getting pretty thin on the ground these days. And so that means that the entry to get in is a lot higher. So not only it's getting harder because you need more money because the property prices are moving up and you can't save quickly enough, right? And so really thinking about how can you strategically get in because once you actually have assets that are compounding for you, and they actually move you at least as fast as the rest of the market. So until you can get your capital to work for you, you're constantly going to be behind the eight ball. So I think it's everyone should be highly incentivized to think about how to, you know, crack that little piece. And and you know, it takes a village to raise a family, and sometimes it takes a really a village to a village to raise a portfolio as well. So it's something to really consider. Yeah, and also to your point as well, Goose, around the idea or the belief or the perhaps like the the conditioning of like, no, I can't borrow from parents or can't borrow from anyone else. I have a client at the moment, Tyler, whose in-laws were wanting to do that. They literally said, here we go, we'll gift you the equity. He's like, no, 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 I've got to do this on my own, right? Because of an old story ego. that he has to ego, right, of the masculine, like, I've got to do this on my own. I've got to prove it to my in-laws. Turns out it just comes from a money conditioning that he didn't actually believe in himself that he could do it. Yes. So- yeah, 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 totally. That's, that's that's super interesting. It's ego, like massively it's ego, right? Because yeah. people say, no, no, I need to do this on my own because I need to prove something to to someone. But then also, yeah, you, there's probably the secondary layer where it's like, uh, I don't want to risk somebody else's money because what if I fail, right? And so, you know, there's this, it, it can be, you know, it's a bit of a double bind, but I'm a very, I'm a very proud uh, guy. Like I don't, like I'm quite proudly very independent. So, but I'm also had help. You know, but when I say had help, nobody like as I say, I always structure it in a very commercial basis. It's like, okay, here's the here's the business plan, here's the value proposition, uh, here's exactly how I'm going to pay you back, even if the thing fails. Here's how I'm going to make sure you get your money back because I'm there's no way that I'm going to default. Like I've got, I'm too proud, for it, right? So I think people can start to take more ownership over it and start to really realize that you know, as long as they're prepared to stay true to their word, there's no reason that they should be afraid of it. So, mm-hmm. amen. Oh, right, let's get on. That is myth number one. So myth number one was that you need your own cash to invest. I think we've debunked that because you don't need to do that. And in fact, you can, if you can get out of your own way and enroll other people in your vision, then you're far more likely to succeed. Myth number two, Liv, is that you should buy your own home first. Why is that a myth? This is probably one of my favorite ones to talk about. <laughs> um, because generally, well, where does this come from? So first of all, the, the great Australian dream of owning your own home. It was actually designed by, first of all, the American banks to convince you to be the little minion to go to your nine to five job to have you pay down a 30 year mortgage that then Australia started copying. And, but do you know what the common factor or the biggest tool that I used was not living in my own home? Yes. That helped me fast track my wealth. It's called rent vesting. We talk a lot about it. Um, and the thing that I see that holds a lot of people back from building their wealth much quicker is not living in their first home and instead building a property portfolio to then building capital to then pay off or buy that dream home. But hang on a second, Lev, right? Isn't is it a home an investment? Like can't they just buy their first investment to live in? Sure you can and sure we'll go up with capital with capital growth. A quote from Robert Kiyosaki is your your home is technically a liability because it doesn't produce income. So one of the reasons why and how it can help by not living in an own home in your own home is number one is when it if you were to move out into the house, let's just say you own a house and you move out next door. All of a sudden you can claim things on that house that you couldn't if you lived in it. So those things such as interest rates, mortgage repayments, water bills, you know, building insurance, these sort of things, all of a sudden they would become a tax deductible expenses that you were already paying for. And then there's also like maintenance and upkeep and stuff like that. Now, these things, not only can they help from a tax deduction perspective, but guess what? They can actually be added back on to your borrowing capacity. They can help your lending. So... All of a sudden, on paper, you've gone from like this big debt weighing you down, you being the little minion going to your nine to five job to pay it off. And the bank's like, oh, hang on. Now you're not paying it off. You've got somebody else paying it off for you. So here we go. We'll give you more borrowing. 
And this is typically the thing that most people need to move forward at the start. And so this is the thing that can absolutely, it's like power boost at the start of building totally. your wealth. There's a couple of other reasons as well, actually. So yeah, there's heaps. Num- num- yeah, there's, there's tons of reasons why buying your, buying your own home first might not be a good idea. Now, I'm just, before I go on to a tirade about this, I'm going to preface this by saying that it's only a bad idea to buy your own home first if your goal is to accelerate your finances, your financial position, right? If your goal is not that, if, if becoming wealthy and you know, doing all that kind of stuff, if that is not a high priority for you, and that some people listening to this might be thinking, what, am I being sarcastic or taking the piss? And I'm like, no, no, I'm being serious. Like, for some people, that is not as important as creating a nest for their family, right? They have their emotional needs are greater than their financial needs. And there's nothing wrong with that. So I don't like it when people try and paint a picture that the only way that you can ever have value in life is if you become rich, right? Or become wealthy. That's not true, right? The goal is to become happy and fulfilled, right? Now, if though you are, you do believe that building wealth and creating financial freedom is going to give you a greater platform to have that life of fulfillment, which is what I believe and which is what you believe, then you're highly incentivized to accelerate your financial position, to build wealth, to become wealthy, and to become financially free. And so if that is a priority, then buying your own home first is probably one of the worst things you can do to build your wealth. There's several reasons that I can think of, which we can riff on as well. Number one is buying in the right location. Now, most people live in Sydney and Melbourne or in these kind of like major metropolitan areas. The statistical probability that where you want to live and where you can afford to live are, are both going to be one and the same, very, very slim, right? So the chances of you buying your first home, which is also going to be in a place where you want to live and you're having that much money is pretty slim. Most people aren't buying one or $2 million houses for their first property. And where most people live, the median house price is like a million bucks, right? Roughly. So, so it, instantly that doesn't even make sense. So then you might want to live in the place that's got a median house price of a million dollars And then because you can't do that, you go, okay, where's the nearest, cheapest place that I can find, right? So then you go to some suburb, which you're only buying there because you can afford to buy there, no other reason. And the statistical probability of that actually being an optimal place to invest is so low that that it's like, you might get lucky. You might, right? But it's like, uh, you've got like like basically a 1% chance roughly of uh, getting, getting that right, which is pretty, pretty slim. So the likelihood is you're not even going to buy in a good location for growth or any of these kind of things. You might get some growth and over time it'll work out, you know, given a long enough time horizon in Australia, you know, property property is always going to kind of, you know, wash its own face given a long enough time horizon. But, you know, you may have to wait a little while. So so the likelihood is you might not buy in the in the right location. You're probably not even going to end up buying a place where you actually want to live. So it won't even be your dream home. And in addition to that, you're going to chew up all your borrowing capacity with a massive liability. So to expand on what you were just saying there, let's say let's say that you um, you're living in an area where the median house price is a million dollars, but your purchasing capability is six hundred thousand dollars, right? Let's just say because based on your deposit, then let's say you're going to move out to some outer ring suburb, right, in some manufactured kind of neighbourhood where there's like little to no character and everyone's in these kind of like cookie cutter, same, same type. No, but that's, like, that's, that's not the great Australian dream. That's the great suburban nightmare. Like that's like, it's, it's, it's horror movie shit, right? Where all the houses look the same and you know, all the people come out, they look at the same, everyone's the same, they drive the same cars. It's nightmare type stuff, right? So you're living in this kind of suburban nightmare and all of a sudden, uh, let's, say you've, let's say you've got $500,000 worth of debt on that $600,000 property, just for simplicity's sake, it wouldn't be the exact amounts. Right, so that five hundred thousand dollars is a liability because, to your point, it's non-income producing debt. Right, so not only do you have one hundred percent of the liability uh, of that debt, you also then have all the costs that you've got to pay that nobody else is paying. And you don't have any of the um, the tax deductions for any of those expenses. So, not only have you ended up living in a place where you probably don't want to live, you've also significantly hampered your ability, and you're probably not going to get as much growth as you would have if you'd invested in a place that's smart to invest. So you're not going to accelerate your capital properly. And also you've significantly damaged your ability to borrow to continue to grow to build your portfolio. So it's like it's a lose, 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 lose kind of scenario versus is the alternative. Just rent wherever you want to live. Right? Live within your financial constraints of your own budget. So you're still saving and you still can invest. And then invest where it makes sense. 
And maybe you can invest in properties that are worth five or six hundred thousand dollars, but maybe you can do that in a place where they're actually going to grow and where they're actually going to be and and the and the rent there's going to be rent coming in, and so you're not going to damage your borrowing capacity. And very quickly you can get from one to two to three to four properties, and over time you're then eventually going to build up enough wealth and enough equity to then be able to use that to buy your actual dream home, right? And so because a lot of people when they think about this they go what so. So I'll never own a home. It's like, no, no, but just tell me. Like, if you're listening to this right now, think of your dream home. Just take a second, just picture your dream home. Probably pretty nice, right? Now, just think, what would the price tag of that be? Probably several million dollars, right? So the amount of deposit you need for that, that home is going to be a lot of money, right? So that you can actually use your portfolio to get you into that dream home by building your wealth, building all the equity you need to pay for it later on. And so if you want to move faster, then yeah, buying your own home first is just just mad. And I think it's the um I think it's just the the one of the worst things people can do. Any any further thoughts on it? Yeah, I'll I, I ask my clients to have a think about what is first of all, it all comes down to your values as well. Yep. What do you value more? Um, for example, uh I had one lady who was Really, really, really valued being in this particular area, suburb, postcode for schools, prestigious schools. I don't know how to say that word. Yeah, prestigious, So yep. what we just showed her instead was like, you know, you could be a rent vester in this area and then you could build that portfolio to then fund buying that property, even if it was to double your dream house, say it's $2 million, it was to double to four or $5 million in five years from now. How do we then build work backwards to build a property portfolio to then fund that? Um, and a lot of another question I would also think about is why is it that you're wanting to get into property to begin with? Is it mm. to control the four walls that you live in, or is it actually for a wealth decision? Bingo. And back to your example of that client, though, right? So let's say she wants to live in an area where there's a prestigious school. So what that says to me is that's probably a higher price suburb, right? So prestigious schools tend not to be in low price suburbs, right, relative to the rest of the market. And higher price suburbs tend to have lower yields. They tend, even if it was an investment property, would probably be heavily negatively geared. And so what does that tell you? What that tells you is that if you were to rent in that property, it would be cheaper to live there and rent it than it would be to own it from a co- on a cost basis. It'll cost you less, most likely it'll cost you less than the mortgage repayments to live there. So you can actually live there. You can actually live in whatever prestigious suburb you like and get whatever you know, outcome you want and pay less than if you'd bought it. And then with all of that surplus capital you've got and surplus savings, go and build a property portfolio. So you know, it's, it's pretty crazy. A lot of people say things like, oh, but I feel unstable when I'm renting. You know, what if the landlord kicks me out or something like that? It's a lot of the fear, right? So in that in that. In that Example, you know, that, that woman might be thinking, but I'm going to send my kids to this school. What if the landlord kicks me out a year later and then they've got to change schools and all of this kind of stuff? You know, you can sign long term leases as well, right? And in my personal experience, I treat any place that we rent, I treat it like my own home. So I, so I don't actually sit there and think, bloody landlord needs to fix the fan. I'll actually go to the, I act like it's my own home because from my perspective, I'm paying to live in a place, it's basically mine. So if the fan breaks, for example, I'll contact the landlord and say, is it okay if I fix the fan, please? Are you good with it? You know, because I treat it like my own home. And guess what happens? If you treat a place like it's your own home, right, and you take care of it, and you're prepared to invest in like actually it being the, you know, no landlord ever is going to say, get out of my house. They're going to be like, this is the best, the best thing in the world, right? I've got someone who's taking care of it. I have like a co like a co-partner in this business enterprise and so you can actually get these situations to your advantage as well but i saw some wild gesticulations there a second ago what did you what, what did you have on that i'm actually personally me and my partner in this we are in this exact scenario right now i just got an email two weeks ago saying where i live my landlord i've got another four months left of my 12 month lease my landlord's like we're selling we've got an offer do you mind ending your lease earlier um, in order for us to go ahead with this sell. Obviously, in the industry, I'm like, yeah, absolutely. Said, in return, let me have a think about it. I'll go out and look out, but can you please give me the most glowing review ever? And then the property manager's like, absolutely. You've been a five star tenant because you've treated it like your own. Thank you so much. So, and now I've now got that property manager plus a couple of other th- firms 
working for me going to look for houses so I don't have to do as many open inspections as well So yeah. and go to them myself. So when you treat it to your point, Goose, like your own home and you are five-star tenant, they will go out of your way as well to help you for the next one. So Bingo. Yeah, so you can use all this kind of stuff to your advantage, right? And most investors, you know, they're playing a long game. And the last thing investors want is they, they actually don't want tenants to move out and to change because it's actually very expensive. So the more that you can become a good tenant, right? And also puts you in better standing with your tenants, right? Because because I'm because I'm a lifelong renter, right? And I've got no aspiration for that to change. I'm I'm good. Like I don't have any, you know. Every, every time I think about that dream home, I think, oh, think about buying. Do you ever do this? Do you ever fantasize about the dream home that you're going to one day buy? I fantasize about it. And then I'll look it up on the internet. I'll look at all these pretty pictures. And, I'm, and I'll be frank, the properties that I'm looking at are pretty bloody expensive, right? We're talking like very high figures. And then I think, geez, I don't know if I'd want to put that much capital into one property. I wonder how much it'd be to rent, right? So, so, in, my, so in my mind, I'm like, there's probably no scenario that I'm going to get to where I'm going to want to buy a home. Like, it doesn't make a lot of sense. And, uh, you know, I think that also puts you in good stead with your own tenants, right? Because when I, with our tenants, They'll be like, uh, oven doesn't work. Cool, fix it. Uh, toilet's broken. Cool, fix it. Like, like I'm, not, I'm not telling them to fix it. I'm not like saying to our property manager, I'm like, yeah, go fix it. Because like, I want to take care of them as much as anything else because I want them to feel good in their home and I want them to stay. And so you can actually use this to your advantage as well. So um, anyway, just by the by. Any other points on this before we move on to the next one? Yeah, one last thing. And when it's your pe- when it's your home and you're living in it, you generally get a lot more emotional to wanting to fix things around the house yes. or upgrade things because you're so emotionally attached and you think that like it's going to add value in some way. But realistically, would you have added that money into the house if you didn't live in it? Um, it's something else to think about too is the opportunity cost of what you're spending on your emotional walls that you're living in versus if you were to reposition it into capital to increase on something in another way to get better return. The amount of homeowners who do little odd jobs around their home under the premise of like it's adding value don't actually understand how value gets added, right? <laughs> right. So, so like adding some extra, you know, decorative things to something to make the property doesn't actually change the value. The value only changes when the is the value only changes when the value gets crystallized, i.e., when you sell it or refinance it. And so, if you actually wanted to increase the value, what you should do is think of all of the things that you can do to increase the value of the property, then do none of them until such time as you're going to get ready to do a refinance, then do all of them. So all of the changes are brand new, so you can accrete the maximum value advantage from all of those things. But but what a lot of people do instead is they'll go, uh, I'll install an air conditioner or it's adding value to the property. But then they might not get a refinance on that property for five years. And it's like, well, a five-year-old air conditioner hasn't really added any value to the property, has it, right? So, so you know, it's made your comfort better, sure, but like call it what it is, right? And so, anyway, anyway, let's get on to the let's get on to the next myth. The next myth, this is a good one because a lot of people believe this, really, really believe it, is that you need to be in a job for six months before you can borrow money. Isn't that true? No, and you know what? I actually didn't think that this was such a common myth that a lot of people were assuming um, until I became a coach. So in the lending world, there's actually over like, I think you've around 440 lenders or so in Australia, give or take. Yep, give or and, take. Yeah, and of those, there are actually lenders out there who will literally give you a pre-approval one day. Some lenders, depending on your broker, this is where your broker comes into place, there are some lenders out there who literally give you hundreds of thousands of dollars of a pre-approval for the next deal one day into a job. Um, so this yeah, is as long where as you have an employment contract. Yeah, all you need an employment. All you need yeah. is an employment contract. Sometimes they'll also want a letter from your employer saying, "No, no, no, like this person's like, we're good." <laughs> yeah, but it's legit. This contract. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. It's good. Yeah, yeah. No, we we or intend to employ them. Like time. one yeah. week's pay slip. One week. Yeah. That's it. That's actually a surprisingly large amount of lenders too, by the way. Like that's a pretty common scenario. That's not just sort of like some back alley lender number 439 on the list of 440 lenders, you know, the guys, you know, operating from the, from the boot of his car down. Somehow. It's no, it's not that at all. It's actually quite a, quite a lot of uh, lenders. What they're looking for is they're looking for, for signs that you're actually gainfully employed, right? So not, they'll also look at your previous financials, by the way. They'll go, do they have enough money? 
you know, out of the hours their spending habits and all that kind of stuff, all that. So you've still got to look good to a lender. And then I just want to know, like, have you got a job, basically? And if yes, then all good. Uh, but there's also other ways you can do it too. There's also low doc loans as well, which you can do without actually having to show any proof of income, eh. which is pretty interesting. So how might people use this? Or do you have any examples of people that, um, that you've worked with that have done this, that, have, that, that thought they needed six months and then turns out they didn't? And what's their story? Yeah. So I had one guy, Jack, he was the same sort of thing. So he was moving, uh, he was in FIFO. So he's about 28 years of age, was moving from one FIFO job to another. Now, luckily on socials, I put out on my stories, you know, you don't need a job. It could be only one, one day, one month into a job. He messaged me and he was like, holy moly, Liv, I was actually waiting because I'm moving from one FIFO job in Queensland to another one in, in WA. I was actually going to wait until three months in till I reached out to you. And I was like, no, nah, man, let's just ask, to go, ask, a, ask a broken out and see what you could do. Let's not assume that you can't. So there's an opportunity cost there as well because if you're waiting three or six months, you could potentially be paying coughing up another $20,000 for the next property. So it's a big assumption to make. Um, it's a costly one. So, and sometimes you can either be, either be in the same role type, just move employers, and the bank could look at it as if you never left or it's just like the same job. Yeah, eyes. that's interesting. That's interesting as well. Yeah, that's that's super interesting. Yeah, if it's the same position, different company, they're going to assume, well, you've still continued to work in that role. Correct. Continuously. Mm. That's super interesting. Yeah, a lot of people get hung up on that. Um, and my advice would be just go speak to a broker because a lot of people self-assess and they say, oh, I can't borrow any money. I was like, well, do you know that? Do you know that? It's like, like on what basis have you assessed yourself to say that you can't borrow any money? And most people don't actually have any grounding on it. They just think that, and it's not really grounded in it. So my suggestion would be, even if you think you can't borrow, go and speak to a broker and just say, hey, can we take a detailed look at my set of circumstances and find out if there's any way that I can borrow and dig into it? Because you may very well find that you can. I know loads of people that thought they had maxed out their borrowing capacity and then went and spoke to a good broker and all of a sudden they had an extra half a million or a million dollars borrowing capacity and they were unstuck. They genuinely thought, I, I'm, I've bought two properties. Uh, I'm tapped out now. I can't buy any more properties. Um, you know, I, I guess I'll revisit this in like another five years or something like that. But instead, they went and spoke to a broker and all of a sudden they had all this additional borrowing capacity they weren't aware of. And then they went, went and bought more properties and off they went. And all of a sudden, they got to five. All of a sudden, they unlocked financial security. And so my strong advice is no matter what position you're in, go and speak to a broker. Even if the broker says, hey, actually, you can't borrow any money right now, then you get to ask, okay, well, why? So w where am I failing here and what would I need to do in order to change that? And it might be a case of like, well, you would need to earn more money or maybe you need to save a bigger deposit or maybe you need to reduce uh, some of your expenses or maybe you've got subscriptions that are uh, not looking good on your thing. So so specifically, why can't I borrow money? Because then you know the exact thing that you need to tackle in order to get the money that you need to go and build a property portfolio. Rather than just saying, oh, no, I, can't, I, can't, I guess I can't borrow. Borrowing is not for me. Property investing is not for me. Just like ask why and then just go work that out. Yeah. Amen. You know, a really good question to also ask is how much extra do I need to earn in order to borrow X, Y, and Z as well? You'd be surprised how little extra you might need to earn in order to get across the line for the next deal. Yeah, 100%, 100%. And also, one, it's mm, gone. I was going to say, I had one lady right now, name's Kate, single mum of two, and she literally was in this exact same scenario. She could only borrow for uh, $200,000 in her current state. Uh, we went back and said, okay, broker, how much extra does she need to earn? It was only seventeen grand extra that she needed to bump her income up by. And so I said, what are you willing to do to sacrifice to earn that 17, that extra 17 grand? So we said, I gave us some options. I said, okay, you could do rent vesting, move out, rent it. It would tick that box or B, go get a part-time job for an extra one or two days a week yeah. just on the side for the next three to six months until we get a property across the line. And she's like, you know what? I could actually do with that extra money. I'm willing to work that extra one or two days a week to do it. Let's do it. Yeah. You know what's so interesting about that though is you mentioned the rent vesting thing because a lot of people who own their own home and then go, oh, I can't borrow. Oh, I need to increase my income in order to be able to borrow more. It's like, well, rent is income, 
right? So, so if you moved out of your home, right, and rented that out for let's say thirty grand a year, guess what? That's thirty thousand dollars of additional income that you suddenly have on your personal income statement, right? That's like people forget that they think that only what matters is what's left over, what's the net cash flow. And that's not true. Actually, what matters is what's the gross income, like how much more income are you making? Because you've already got the expenses, they're not changing. So uh, that's a huge one. That's massive. Yeah, and I think um, the the other thing, the other thing as well, is go speak to a couple of brokers. Because just about to say that, yeah, yeah, because like, up. don't give up. Just if you go mm-hmm. to speak to one broker and they say no, just say okay, that's cool. Like dig into it, try and work it out. And go speak to a few more because there are loads of different brokers and there are lots of good ones, right? There are lots of not so good ones, but even with the good ones, they'll be good in different ways. Right, so some might be good because they're really fast, and some might be good because they they understand really complex deals, and something like so. You really got even if you're dealing with good brokers, even if someone's like this broker is like the best broker ever, it's like yeah, they probably are in certain ways. Um, but even if they say no, you need to go find somebody else who says they've got the best broker ever and go speak to that one, and you just got to keep doing that until, you, and you might go speak to four or five or six or seven different brokers until you find somebody who says actually, you know what, if we did this and this and this. We can put a deal together. And that's what you want to fight. Amen. Yeah, I did that with my super. I remember I got knocked back and I went to eight brokers. Finally, the first seven said, nah, you don't have enough money. Go away. Nah, you don't have enough. And I was like, these guys aren't asking me the right question. They're assuming that I want to buy a property for 400000 I was just wanting to buy a property for 200000 Finally, broker number eight was asking me the right questions. And then I was jumping in saying, but what if I purchased it at this price? Now do I have enough? Can I borrow? Oh, yeah, of course you can. Cheers. So yeah, be persistent. Don't give up. Don't like if you think about it, you want to build an entire multi million dollar property portfolio and you're taking advice from one just one person who told you no. That's a huge opportunity cost. I usually don't take advice from anyone who tells me no about anything. <laughs> if they say no, I'm speaking to the wrong person, right? It was like not possible. Not I, okay, cool. I better go speak to someone else. Got it. Um speaking of myths though, next one, number four. The myth is that you need to become a, you need to be a high income earner. Now, this is such a good one, right? Because I've said this, I've mentioned this quite a few times on the podcast, but you know, a, few, a couple of years ago, I spoke to um, Gabby's younger brother, who's at the time he was in his early twenties or something like that. And I was, I was asking him, I said, "Hey, um, how do you and your friends think about buying? Think about investing in real estate because they're all investing in crypto and all of this kind of stuff." It's like, why aren't you guys investing in real estate? And he said, "Well, because houses cost a million dollars, so we can't afford it." Right? And so there's this belief that in order to get into the market, you've got to already be wealthy. You have to have a huge income. You've got to be able to buy these million-dollar properties and all of this kind of stuff. And so, again, this is where people self-assess and they say, well, I'm not rich, so I, I, guess, uh, I guess I can't get in. I mean, just frankly, like I know people that are my age, so I'm 37. And so like a lot of my former peer group from when I was doing festivals and stuff, they're all about the same age, so we'll say mid-30s. I would say probably 90% of those don't own a home or an, or an investment property, for that matter. They don't own any real estate. And it would be because they would believe primarily that they can't, that, that it's all gotten away from them. Oh, you know, boomers stole my dreams. We can't, blah, blah, all this kind of stuff, and they're never going to get in. Yet, yet, you're sitting here talking about, 20-year-olds who are going to buy a property, 25-year-olds going to buy a property, right? And so this whole idea that you need, that, that number one, it's out of reach, is crazy. And number two, that you need to be you know, on a st- stupidly high income to make it work is just, is just bonkers. So what's your take on this? Why, why don't you need to be a high income earner? Because people assume that you need to buy properties more expensive than what you need to. And there's just the, I suppose, the what bleeds reads, right, in the media as well. So they probably put a lot of fear and assumptions into the average purchase price but like I've got clients every day that are earning 60 70 eighty thousand dollars a year I've got a landscaping client on 70 grand I've got a single mum who works at uh Coles earning eighty one thousand dollars a year she's got two kids and your team's the sourcing her property right now as we speak which is great so I've got another single mum who's literally couch surfing across literally she's got a single six-year-old da- daughter she's couch surfing not wanting to increase her expenses at the moment, getting rent, not wanting that to is, add on That's on the expenses. extreme end of things. A lot of people this are thinking- This is extreme. Yeah, yeah. Yes. A lot of people are like, hang on a second. So you're telling me I need to go couch surfing with my children in order to buy a property. 
Okay. I, I commend her, by the way, for her commitment. I think that's awesome. Right? I think it's, I'm like, hell yeah, go for it. Like, that's, that's great. I, like, I'm a, I'm a big fan. You don't have to do that, though, just so we're all on the same page. It doesn't mean that you need to go couch surfing um, with, your, with your six-year-old. But what it, does, what it does probably point to is that you get to prioritize. You get to prioritize what's actually more important to you because it's very easy, even when you're not earning that much, everyone's wages go up generally, not down. Right, so even if you're only earning sixty grand a year, you probably not that long ago were earning forty grand a year, right? So your you, so your wages have probably gone up a pretty significant amount versus where they were, and guess what's probably also gone up? Your expenses, prices. yeah, Wait, but also your too. expenses, yes. yeah. But you're probably spending more money. You're probably like, oh yeah, yeah. look, I'm, I'm I can get okay. So if you just control your expenses a little bit, right? Prioritize what's more important: steak dinners or financial freedom? Right, work that out. Just just. Do it in your own mind. And hey, by the way, sometimes steak dinners are going to be more important, right? So every now and then it's okay. But um, maybe not if you're a vegan, of course, but, you know, <laughs> hey. Um, but th- the point is, like, you can actually really think about how to do this strategically because the sooner you get started, you mentioned opportunity cost a minute ago, you know, and we in, in the example you used, you were giving it a couple of months. Like, if you wait a few months, you might have to fork out another 20 grand or something for a deposit. The opportunity cost of waiting years is is potentially hundreds of thousands of dollars, particularly when you look at the compound rate of what you could have achieved if you started earlier, right? And so, you know, you're pretty incentivized to get started early. And for some people, it does mean making decisions around their current set of circumstances. So we've had plenty of clients and some some of uh, your coaching clients that have come to work with Dashdot who have strategically been living at home. You know, they're in their, in their mid-20s-ish. And we've even had some clients that have been in their 30s who went, you know what, actually the way to get ahead is for me to go back, live at my live with my parents, um, even with a family. I know one of our one of our um at least one of our clients moved back with their family, moved back to their parents' house, even though they were on reasonable incomes, so that they could number one, save more, number two, increase their borrowing capacity, so they could become financially independent in like three to five years versus thirty years, right? So it seems like a pretty good trade off, right? So hey, Mark. Yeah, so it's a pretty um like understanding you don't need to be on a six-figure income just to get started is, is critical. Yeah. You know, that must be the same. We might be talking about the same client there. have got one, Augusty. He's doing the same thing. He goes, Liv, I'm moving back into the, into the in-laws. And they've got three kids as well. Really? Yeah. Three kids. He's working FIFO. His wife has stayed home, looks after the kids, and he's like, we're just going to 10X our, our wealth. He's like, I'll be able to save so much quicker that we're just going to go hard for the next 24 months. I was like, here you go, mate. And he'll be able to put more into his portfolio to begin with to boost that yep. compounding. Yep. Yeah, totally. And again, you know, the thing about debt is that there are so many lenders as well, right? So th- there's always only ever going to be three constraints in your property portfolio, access to capital, access to cash flow, access to debt. Now, when you're a lower income earner, one of the biggest issues is going to be access to debt as well, access to capital, right? Savings and also access to debt. And so, but one of the things you can think about with debt is that oftentimes you can get debt even if it's a higher interest rate, right? So think about how to get started, right? You're not looking for the cheapest interest rate or you, you're looking for a way to get into the market, right? So looking for ways that you can get debt, looking for ways that you can get capital, look at, looking for ways that you can lower your expenses is going to put you in a significantly better position. But yeah, it's, it's, it's empowering to know that even, in, even today, you can build a property portfolio on a single income less than $100,000. And that's pretty empowering because what that points to is that it's not out of reach. Like you can still do it, which is useful because a lot of people still have this belief that they just can't. Hopefully there's a few people have just listened to this and decided Hopefully. to reach out. Hopefully. All right. So let's talk about this next one. Uh, the myth is that you need to buy property that's local to you. What do you mean? Well, this is what your forte is, your team. Yeah. buying in high growth areas, but you know what? I typically see this from tradies, tradies who are like, I need to drive past it and control it and fix that broken toilet myself. And the amount of time where that hinders people, it's a lot. It's very common when people come to me and they've only got one or two and they're stuck. I say, why did you buy in that area? Well, it was just down the road. I can look at it. I can drive past it. I'm like, do you know that you're not allowed in it though? Legally, it's their house. <laughs> you are not allowed to go into that house yourself. And that 
ends up being, again, something where people think that they need to save money to fix it themselves because there's people, tradies out there who might be doing dodgies and, and charging you more. And it's just not true because there are really, really, really good tradesmen out there who are ethical. And the other way around is you can just get a couple more quotes for things as well, like get two or three quotes as opposed to just one to fix an item. But yeah, touching it and feeling it, there's again, opportunity cost there because you might be buying in an area that's not going to be so high growth and you're restricting yourself from focusing on the numbers because you emotionally think you need to see it. Exactly. Yeah. The statistical, I mentioned this earlier, the statistical probability of you buying locally and that also being the best time and place to invest and also even the best property in it is pretty low. Like it's not, not, it's not that it doesn't happen, um, but it's just low, right? Particularly if you're not sophisticated, like it's luck, not strategic planning, right? Is the, is the way that it happens. And yeah, this idea that you need to be able to touch it and feel it and go past it, it's just madness. I mean, I've said it loads of times before on this show, but Anyone who's ever invested in shares, it's like, well, when was the last time you visited your shares? Have you gone into the BHP office and gone and like seen all the employees? And do you go in there to go fix the freaking broken toilet in the BHP office? No, you don't, right? You let the business run the business. You get on with it. Like, uh, del- I deliberately, Gabby and I deliberately don't go and look at our investment properties. Like, even though even we've there's a couple now, a couple of times we've been in a position. Like we've got one in Victoria, which we sort of go past when we go uh, to to uh, visit Gabby's family. We never like I'm like why I don't want to see it. I don't want to look at it because at the moment it's a it's a it's an investment, right? And as soon as I then go and start, even though we used to live in it, right, and it, which is an interesting that was genuine investment property, but but you know the whole idea that you need to go like people are like oh but what if the toilet breaks? What if what if in the middle of, and I'm like do you really want to go and fix a broken toilet on a weekend? No. You don't. That's what a property manager is there for, right? And like, even if you have the skills to go and do it, but why would I pay somebody else to do something that I can do myself? Because you're not looking for more jobs. You're looking for more freedom, right? Like, like guess what? There's lots of broken toilets. There are lots of broken toilets. Do you want to just fix broken toilets 24 hours a day, seven days a week? No, because at some point you want to do something other than fixing bloody broken toilets. And the whole idea of investing in property is not so that you, because some people are like, I want to be able to manage the property myself, right? Or, or, or do all this kind of stuff. It's like the whole idea of investing in property is to create more freedom. And unless you've got some unfulfilled desire to become a property manager or some obsessive you know, passion for just fixing broken stuff at random hours, like unless that, like unless that is like somehow just so enriching and fulfilling you should be avoiding it at all costs you should just not be doing it like i don't like i don't seek out additional you know garbage jobs for me to do i don't go through the apartment block that i live in and go hey have you got any broken pipes that i could fix no like i don't i go to the freaking beach you know and it's like you can actually use your time better if you don't buy locally because the light and you know and you get to your to your point you know, what are you going to do? Go peek through the curtains whilst people are in the living room? Like, you'll get bloody arrested if you do that. Like, it's not, you can't do that. So, even if, because we've actually had, we actually had a client a couple of years ago, by the way, who um was living in Rockhampton, right? And it's quite a funny story. And this is before Rockhampton became a bit of a hotspot and we just started buying there. Um, and they lived in Rockhampton and I remember speaking to them and they, and I said, all right, so do you mind like, you know, any locations like on off the you know any anywhere we shouldn't buy? I said, look, I don't care. Trust you guys, we could buy anywhere as long as we don't buy in Rockhampton. And then, <laughs> <laughs> and then, then the team kind of missed that bit of the memo, and they found this awesome property. And it was awesome, like a real screamer, and it was in Rockhampton. <laughs> uh, but thankfully, the clients were able to look beyond that, and they were able to go, okay, look, this is an investment, right? So. They actually took a global view and they said, oh, okay, well, it turns out that the best opportunity is right here. But they still said, right, we're getting a property manager. We, like, and the guy was a tradie, by the way. He's like, I want nothing to do with it. And so he was still able smart to segment guy. that. Yeah, yeah, smart guy. So like, I think you do yourself a massive disservice if you think you need to buy, buy a property locally. And wherever your energy goes, your money flows. If you're focusing on trying to save, skim on a $10 you know, toilet lid over here, you could potentially be missing out on 
you know, making a lot more money or getting learning how to increase your borrowing capacity or get more of the money over here in other ways. So, yeah, and an easy way to think about it is uh, is the is the value of time, right? So let's just say let's just let's just say there's a theoretical example here where there's an investor uh, family, right? Husband, wife, and two kids, right? And the parents are probably investing. Probably one of their goals is to be able to spend more time with their kids. It's a pretty common outcome, pretty common thing that they want. So then if you're setting yourself up to go and buy a, a fix a new toilet, fix a toilet on a weekend, right, that might cost you $40, $50 an hour to pay somebody else to go fix it. Well, the question you've got to ask yourself is, would you spend 40 or $50 an hour to have that time to have memories with your family? And the answer is probably yes. Probably yes. Right, unless you were really desperate for the cash, I think most people, if you if you said, all right, is your because if you, the the alternative is that you say no, fifty dollars is worth more than spending time with my family. That's like that doesn't sound right, does it? So if you really cook it down to how are you prioritizing the value of your time, you should be getting people out. You should be outsourcing all this stuff as much as possible. So even if you end up buying in a local area, you should be as hands off as possible. I think. Amen. They say, uh, uh Rich people prioritize time. Yeah. Prioritize time, you're always looking for ways to get your time back. Yep. 100%. 100%. Yeah, it's the, most, it's the single most valuable resource we have. And it's like, and that's not a cliche either. Like, it's a, like it's a legitimate thing. I mean, the, the, the whole point, right? You really just want to cook down this whole ecosystem of things. Why do we work? Why do we do anything? Like, we, we're doing all of this kind of stuff because we're trying to create freedom. Now, we can argue that the capitalist construct, um, is designed in such a way that it doesn't create freedom, right? That it's uh, that it's built on the premise of in, of indentured servitude and all of this kind of stuff. And you can draw that bow pretty pretty easily. The question you've got to ask yourself is, what are you going to do about it? Like, are you just going to continue to participate in that system and just go, okay, I guess I'm just never going to have that freedom? Or, or do you actually want to aggressively fight to take back the most important thing to you, which is your time? And so if the goal is more life, then you should be making decisions that align with more life, not more work. So, oh, music to my ears. <laughs> nice, Liv. Let's break this apart into two episodes. So, if you are listening to this, this is part one. We have got how many more? Four more. Four more. Four. We've already done five. Yeah, four. Okay, that makes sense. I do. I can do math. So I promise that's nine. Uh, so, so we've got four more myths to get through. So let's leave it here for this episode. This is part one. Join us next week for part two of this awesome episode where we cover nine, nine of the biggest myths in property investing busted. Liv, I've enjoyed having you on. Are you ready for the next episode? Let's do the next one. See you on the next one.